Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lisa Lanzalotti, the Marketing Manager here at Massey, and I'd like to thank you for joining our webinar on accredited versus non-accredited calibration. Uh, just a few housekeeping items before I turn it over to the presenters. Uh, if you will notice on the control panel, up, it should be on the right side of your screen, there is a section where you can type in questions that you would like us to ask the panelists during the Q&A session. There is also a way that you can raise your hand um, if you have anything that you would like to ask during the presentation. Please go next to your name and click on the small hand. And I also want to point out that there is a handout available for you. It's a copy of this presentation and you can download that under the handout section. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Aliberti. He is the Director of Metrology here at Massey. Thank you, Lisa. Um, thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us. Um, this is a service that we're, we're starting to offer uh, webinars. So Metrology, in general, will be doing quite a few of these, as well as the rest of the um, company. So as you can see in this backdrop, this picture here, um, this is our primary thermometry line uh, with our fixed point cells. And this is one of our senior metrologists. Uh, just to give you an idea of you know some of the equipment that we use um, so jumping in uh, we'll start with the panelists um, i'll let john go first because uh he uh, likes to talk so anyway john if you could uh, introduce yourself hey thank you hello Hi, i'm uh, john Massiello, executive vice president co-founder i've uh, been with massey for 35 years involved in all aspects of the business and uh what's near and dear to me is the metrology portion of it because it's uh it's kind of the root of all measurements and things that we uh do here at massey and phil hey how you doing thanks my name is phil kendall i am the sales manager here at massey for calibration services um have been here about four years now and really excited to work with a group of people that we have here and Hopefully, uh, everybody can learn a little something from Michael's presentation. And thank you, guys. And uh, I'm Mike Alberti, as you can see. I'm the director of metrology here at uh, Massey. And um, just a just a quick um, rough idea. This uh, this is not going to be a deep dive. Obviously, we're, we're trying to keep it topical. Um, it's going to outline some of the things that uh, you know to expect at an accreditation lab or what that looks like. And obviously, if there's any questions that come up, as Lisa mentioned earlier. Uh, feel free to um, add them on the side, or if you think of a question after the fact, um, you know, our information will be available to start a dialogue in that regard. Um, having said that, I believe we have a poll question that we're going to kick this thing off with. Lisa, am I correct? You are correct, Mike. I'm going to get that loaded right now. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna wait for that to kind of go a little bit before I uh, move on. So if you could just tell me when we're good to go, I'd appreciate it. Okay. We have about 35%, 40% have voted so far. So we're just gonna wait another couple of seconds. Let some more people. Answers are still coming in. So I think I'll press on a little bit and then we can circle back. Mm -hmm. or do you... Yep, so we're, I think we're done now. The, uh, the numbers have stopped. It looks like 79% say yes, 5% say no about requiring accreditation, and then 15% aren't sure. Excellent, good. So hopefully at the end of this presentation or during it, at some point, um, some of the uh, 15% can say yes or no, and maybe some of the folks that maybe said no because they didn't quite understand it will maybe say yes. So that's the whole idea here is to just give information. So having said that, um, so what is ISO 17025? Um, most people think that it's a metrology document, or it's a calibration document. It's not. It's a testing labs document if, in layman's term. It's, it's for competency of testing labs, not just metrology related. So people need to understand that. Because um, the document has a lot of um, things in it, such as sampling and things like that, that might not necessarily apply to a metrology lab, or it may. So just keep that in mind. I mean, Mexico 17025 is, in fact, competence of testing labs. 
Um, it outlines a quality system uh, that would need to be put into place before and after the measurement is taken. This is important. Uh, there's a fair amount of upfront work that is uh, being done to ensure that you know all of the, the key points or compliance points that are outlined in our governing document uh, is being adhered to. So it's a it's a very um, a very important point as far as quality is concerned. Uh, there's a peace of mind that the customer lab is adhering to a governing document such as 17025 because it has very strict guidelines in it. You know, using a non-accredited or um, a calibration lab that chooses not to get their accreditation, it really doesn't give you that peace of mind that they're adhering to any or subscribing to any hierarchy or any beliefs of doing it right or uniform or uniformity in, in regards to um, the, the national uh, standards or national metrology institutes or the NMIs, things like that. Um, so some of the, again, not a deep dive, some of the differences between ISO 17025 and some folks that choose to just have 9001 certification. Um, 17025 is an internationally recognized standard. It's for the competence um, of, of metrology or testing labs, as I mentioned earlier, and it has or carries with it um, subject matter experts, uh, the, the, the assessors that will come on site and, and really, you know, scrutinize your processes and vet the processes in and, and prove to, to you and to your customers that you are in fact adhering to a document. Um, proves that a particular laboratory is able to produce precision or precise and accurate test results and calibration data. Again, goes hand in hand, you know, creating data or making a measurement is only part of the infrastructure that happens in a proper metrology house or a metrology lab. So it, th these are very important parts to understand that when you, when you, when you deal with a uh, 17025 accredited lab, it, you're getting a, a system that's been put in place and, and tried and true and tested that adheres to um, all of the requirements of the document. Um, John or Phil at any time, if you guys like to just sure. jump in or add anything, and, um, I, I sure. will. I I'll stop talking for 12 seconds. Yeah, sure. On the on the ISO 9001, you know where it's it is. Everybody recalls it. It's it's document what you do what you document, and you know if you follow that, you, know, you tend to check yourself, and you know it's it, it kind of a checks in and balances and you know what have you. But on 17 or 25, you have a third party verifying. You have your own. You have your internal. You have a specific guidelines. You have a validation method for it. So it's not just simply have a standard, it's good enough, it should work, I know what I'm doing, I've been doing it long enough. It's not that, it's, it's all around. And whether you have Phil do it or Mike do it or John do something, you have to have the consistency and you have to have the uncertainty, no matter who does it, what time of the day, what standards they use. So this is different than 9001. And as we'll go through, we will cover some of the, some of the levels of which one you do. Everybody doesn't need 17025. And they are going to 9,000 So, and as you can see behind me, I, I, I wanted to make mention earlier on that I'm actually in the mass lab um, for our mass testing, um, just to give it a backdrop of all the comparatives over my right or left shoulder. I know it gets flipped. Um, so I'm in the mass lab. Phil, I believe, is set up in our primary pressure lab, um, and John is in his very lush office. <laughs> The, the lights just turned off. Another question that, um, that we get constantly is, you know, NIST traceable or traceable to the SI. So, you know, just to kind of give a pyramid here, um, and again, this is this is a very um, common used um, analogy or a commonly used diagram. And what it has is it has the process instrumentation on the bottom. That is, you know, typical end users that might have analytical balances or pH meters or, you know, any type of equipment in that regard. You have the working standards or the equipment that the calibration technician is used to make a measurement against the process equipment. Uh, you have the primary standards, which uh, again, just like the chain and, and as you can see the pyramid, those primary standards are used against the working standards. The primary standards obviously being uh, a more finite or more accurate uh, device or a more accurate way or to quantify um, an artifact or a unit of measure. And then above that you have NIST, which is the, you know, the the National um, Institute of Standards and Technology, which is an NMI and uh, National Metrology Institute. Um, they obviously sit at the top as well as, you know, um, NRC and, and, and things like that. 
uh, Danic and, so, and such. Um, and then above that is the SI units, which I know SI units, people see that and say, what does it stand for? It actually stands for the International System of Units. Um, so the SI base units is 22 subs, and the most recent, probably familiar um, artifact was the one kilogram. I'm sure many of you heard that it was being retired in, in favor of quantum-based um, SI. So the artifact, the one kilogram weight, has been decommissioned in favor of a new way to quantify uh, mass. And I believe it's uh, the Kibble Balance, which I have seen in person, which is amazing. Um, I have been to NIST. Um, it's you know quite a quite a operation, as you could imagine. So. Uh, so the, yeah, the SI unit is the uh, the actual unit of measure that that all in that category would subscribe to. So when is accredited? I apologize for the talk. When is accreditation needed? I um the keyboard apparently when I created this. Um, so the same pyramid, and, and what I wanted to do is kind of to John's point earlier. I wanted to talk about a little bit of when is it needed, when is it not? It's very easy to say it's needed in full stop no matter what. And and I agree with you to a degree, but I'm gonna explain one scenario here that might help you understand whether you need an accredited cal or, I mean, because let's be honest, with an accredited cal, it, there's an increase in cost, uh, there's an increase of risk. Um, so let's, let's talk about it. So process instrumentation, accredited calibration is preferred. The reason why we say preferred is Take a system, um, you know, I don't know, an RO system or a WIFI system or anything like that. If it has a pressure gauge on it, and that pressure gauge is functionality, it's reference or non-critical, and it's just for maybe a facilities technician or a process engineer to walk by and physically just look and say, yes, that is reading something. I know that pressure or liquid is flowing through the pipe. It is not the critical measurement for the device. The critical measurement of the device could be the transmitter. It could be a number of things those or the devices used to measure it those you would want to focus on having the best measurement possible but as far as a go no go gauge you know just a visual indicator of a pressure gauge it's probably not necessary it's not you're not building any data off it you're not using it to do a batch record or anything like that you're just using it like i said as a, as a, as a physical indicator to say yes the system is operation operating as it should um having said you know, looking up the same chain for working standards and primary standards, well, it's a necessity, it's a must. You, you know, making good measurements in the metrology world or in a calibration world, um, taking all aspects of the measurement into the equation is paramount. Um, that way there, the reason of the doubt, or you can minimize it or mitigate it. So as far as working standards is concerned, absolutely. All you metrology labs internal that work for the, you know, pharmaceutical companies, biotech companies, you would send that equipment to a company like ours, for instance, that offers primary uh, level calibrations. And those primary level calibrations are gonna be used to calibrate, like I mentioned earlier, your working standards. Of course you want those to be part of your accreditation or accredited body. Because you, you how can you quantify something uh, as a working standard with something that hasn't been quantified as good? It doesn't make sense. So if you look at the pyramid, the pyramid and the angle of the pyramid actually makes sense because it, it shows to some degree, the level of accuracy or the, the hierarchy as a process equipment obviously is gonna be a little bit spec looser than a working standard and so on and so forth. So this, this, this kind of pyramid does a good job of explaining all of this, but it also shows you how, as you get higher up the chain, the, the accuracy or its ability becomes really finite. National standards. They, they are, you know, our accreditation body through NAVLAP is a division of NIST, and they are the, the, the folks that design the science or, or create the science or prove the science. Um, everything we get from our accreditation and everything that we perform in our daily, you know, is credence to all of the hard work that it's being proven out at the highest level, um, which also means that they are very well in tune with DSI units. So, I did not put in the slide that national standards should be accredited for, for that very reason. Uh, focusing on primary standards and working standards is very important, and then the process instrumentation um, outline that I um, that I outlined earlier about a, a reference gauge. I'm, I'm sorry, John or Phil, if you wanted to chime in, I can go back. Yeah, if, if I well, if I could from the from the the difference on the working standard versus process instrumentation, you know, uh, accredited versus not accredited. You know, there's always from the business hat to the business sense. There's a cost to one of them, and there's a performance to the other one. As Mike was saying, performance. You utilize it for the performance necessary, the quality needed, 
okay? And there's a price associated with it. So on the reference gauges, as Mike was saying, as, as for autoclave, though, I need to know whether it has pressure or it doesn't have pressure. I don't care what pressure. You know, those are some of the non-critical you know, uh, rooms, uh, non-critical rooms. Those are the things you have, and you can break them down into differences, and therefore it saves money. You don't waste money. Good. Very good points. Um, so benefits of an accredited calibration, uh, we're going to just talk a little bit more about that. Uh, testing lab adheres to a standard, as we mentioned earlier. It's outlined in 17035. Uh, proofs competency, this is important. Proficiency testing, uh, all methods, process, and measurements are verified. Uh, proficiency testing is a, is, a big, um, is a big part of the quality system as far as the measurement. Um, it's essentially a blind test of an artifact. Uh, it's facilitated uh, specifically by, you know, NAVLAP or Interlaboratory or, you know, any other accreditation body. And, and essentially what it's doing is, is they're sending an artifact in, whether it's an SBRT or, you know, a weight set, and we're challenging that device, that artifact, against our best capabilities. And we're, we're taking that data when we're sending it into the um, facilitator, and they, they take a look at the data and then they give us our next, next instructions. You don't necessarily have to adjust it or maybe they want you to adjust it. They're gonna take that data and they're gonna carry on with that artifact to the next lab and so on and so forth. And then they, they kind of crunch the numbers and they see, is it agreeable? Is Massey in line with other um, you know, uh, testing labs that, that had the same proficiency test? Uh, so, so basically it's their way of not showing up but you throwing your best capabilities at the artifact and, and proving out if you're actually doing it right. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very powerful tool and very important. Uh, quality, measurement uncertainty is taken into account when a statement of conformity is stated or requested. This is a big one. This is a 2017 add-on where the customers that are maybe unknown to them or not really understand the uncertainty, it was okay to make the measurement and then report the uncertainty and make a statement pass fail without taking the uncertainty into the equation. You didn't have to, there wasn't a requirement or it was very kind of loosey-goosey, if you will. Uh, 2017 changes that. It, it's, it's saying that if a customer requests it or you're gonna make it a statement of conformity, you're gonna have to take all aspects of the measurement in, in which you should. I mean, it, it'd be disingenuous otherwise because customers may not understand what they're actually getting, not realize maybe the uncertainty ratio um, isn't great. Maybe it's close to one to one, or maybe it's an inverse. Maybe it's you know 0 0.8 to one, or what have you. So it's very important as us as the subject matter experts in metrology to to kind of safeguard or guard ban. We'll get into that, but to safeguard our customers to make sure that they're getting um, what they're expecting from us, which is true value. Um, the, the signatory has to be registered with the with the accreditation body. We're very fortunate here at Massey, for instance that we have a separate standalone quality department. Uh, they're all signatories with NAVLAP, so as if the technician or the metrologist makes the measurement, it goes through our quality process and the quality independently reviews it and signs off on it. That's a, it's a pretty big uh, plus for us uh, here, and I know a lot of labs you know, do have that luxury as well, um, but it really helps us maintain a, a return rate from our customer of less than 0.01%. Um, when we send certificates out to the customer, um, we, we, we might get one back, we might not, but the, the percentages for my metrics, success is 99.98% for Massey, which as a director as of the operation, in my background in GMP environments, you can't ask for anything better than that. So the uh, signatory, like I said, has to be registered. All calculations and documents supporting the uncertainties that are published on your scope of accreditation. If we just talk about the scope of accreditation and what that is, you're basically outlining your absolute best capabilities that you can reproduce. That's not necessarily saying that you're going to be able to achieve those numbers with every measurement, because obviously the unit under test and its resolution and things like that would play into it. But what we, what you, when you hear the scope of accreditation, you're looking at the metrologies, um, kind of what they can do, at absolute full stop, best, best they can offer in that regard. And Massey's. Uh, scope of accreditation is on our website that anybody can download at any time or you, it's a PDF. Uh, you can, you know, have a copy of it. But um, That is another thing that, you know, you have to do. You have to produce to your potential customers. You know, what, what is, what, what can I offer you absolute drop dead best uncertainty numbers in a perfect world? And that's what we have to prove. And we also conduct round robins, you know, I'm not saying everyone does that, but what we do is our quality group independently 
has two technicians perform a calibration with maybe two two different standards of the same model or or uh, two different pieces of equipment or the same piece of equipment and they're they're checking to make sure that it's agreeable it's like a proficiency test in a sense but we do it against our quality system and against our documents and following our documents and making the measurement so again this is very important to someone like me who came from an fda regulated uh, facility and understand what the what it means to deliver a quality product and what's behind the calibration this piece of equipment could be used for life-saving drugs or life-altering drugs so it's very important to us that we make sure we get it right mm -hmm. and again so anyway, uh, if i'd like guys, to touch uh, base about the um the certificate process that we go through here at massey it is a three-step process to ensure that the everything on the cert is correct and accurate going to the customer and it starts with the, yeah. with the um, with the tech reviewing his own work, and then it goes to peer review where another calibration tech will review that cert. And that happens before it goes to quality. And once the peer review is completed, quality will then take it, review the cert, and then pass it along for its final disposition. That's good. Very good. Good point, Phil. I'd also like to add, I think we have another poll question coming up. So okay. if, if Lisa wants to post that. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced that the poll questions are merely to make sure people are awake after listening to me drone on. Don't give away the secrets, Mike. <laughs> All right, we have people voting. Give it a few more seconds. This is a popular question, so we're going to let people keep answering. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to close the poll and share the results on the screen. So it looks like 67% feel that guard banding is important to their process. 10% uh, say no, it is not, and 24% are not sure. Okay. Good, great questions. Um, so, and in, in just before we go forward, talking about guard banding, again, it's not going to be a deep dive. So all of, all of you who might have more interest in it or might not get what you're after after this, please feel free to reach out to, to me or John or Phil. Uh, marketing will we'll give you guys our information um, if you have some questions about it or if you, like I said, at any time. So just keep that in mind, please. So as far as, as guard banding is concerned in 2017, um, because of our NAVLAP accreditation, also with the ILAC watermark, we opted to go with the G8 um, um, literature for example three, which is um, equal to a less than a 2% false except global risk. And as you can see, this is not massively developed. This is not me or one of the metrologists in an office somewhere figuring this out. This is published information that is that can be used um, by anybody. Um, and basically, we'll, we'll walk through real quick. The acceptance limit is the, is going to be the new the new number value after the guard band is either added or subtracted. A tolerance limit is, is what you many of you would expect is the actual tolerance. The the guard band area, which is in yellow, which is basically the the stop, stop the false, accept the false, the false, reject area, and then the uncertainty. So quickly looking at this, if you look at AL, that's the acceptance line. If you took that out, your tolerance would be the TL. And what we're doing is, as you can see by the equation, we're just taking the tolerance limit squared it, and we're minus in the uncertainty squared. And then we're, we're coming up with a new acceptance limit. And what this is saying that there's a 98% accuracy to your measurement. So we make a statement of conformity, pass, fail, intolerance, out of tolerance. It, it is going to be looked at, you know, just like uncertainties themselves, K equals two is 95% confidence. That's, that's not 100%. Nothing is 100%. So this is a 98% um, risk um, analysis that basically will take the measurement and it will take the, the, the tolerance and the and uncertainty and come out with an acceptance limit. So this is important because when we make a statement of conformity saying pass, like I said, this equation is going to be run. So the uncertainty will be taken into the measurement going forward. And then on top of that, I'm kind of to pull it all together. And again, as many, and I, and I failed to mention earlier on, 
that 2005 was the last revision of 17025, and then 2017 starts significant rewrite. And in that rewrite, one of the things was carbon or uh, false accept rate or statement of conformity. So a lot of the metrology labs, such as us, had to kind of change the way that we offer things or change the way we do business. And we wanted to for the sake of quality. So if you look at what we have here, this is the new offerings from Massey. Um, many of you who do business with us right now, um, you know, you would get the accredited CalCert with uncertainties, with no statement of conformity and no guide manning and no risk, um, no risk approach. Um, and, or you get a non-accredited, which is essentially the same measurement without the uncertainties. Um, so as you can see, as one, this is an accredited Cal. It's in accordance with the, uh, the mathematical uh, principle on the previous slide. It includes the guide banding risk with false accept, has the uncertainties in the statement of conformity. And as you can see by the blurb there, it's exactly what I just said. If I say a unit passes or fails, all aspects of the measurement are quantified in that result. It's not just a reporting of data. Um, level two, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop this, but I'm gonna let uh, Phil kind of chime in with me as well. But it's important to understand what level two is. And level two is no statement of conformity. It's the measurement itself, it's the uncertainty itself. The uncertainty is not taken into the equation um, for, for pass or fail. And, and we got a question, we get questions on this quite a lot, like why would I want that? And I can explain it to you. If, if you have an, a standard or a piece of equipment, and hypothetically that piece of equipment is plus or minus one, arbitrarily we'll just pick a number, and the device itself is capable of point one. Well, if, if I run it through my process and then I give you a fail because it was at point three with the guard banding and then you get it back and say, yeah, but I only care about one. Can you redo this, sir? Or um, let me justify it by writing this big dissertation on why it didn't impact my process. So we actually, some of our is we actually go with option two. They give us the data, they give us the uncertainty. We have a process in place at Nancy where we receive that information. We look at it, we put a cover sheet to it with an explanation as to why. We looked at the uncertainty, we did the calculations, and this is our number, which is a bit wider than the manufacturer, and this is why we choose option two. So that you, you might you might not have to have option one. Option two gives you the ability to take the information and then you run it through your own criteria. Right um, and if Phil, if you wanted to kind of chime in a little bit, if I missed anything on that, I'd appreciate it. No, I think you, you nailed that pretty good, Mike, as usual. Um, again, it, it does not give a determination of pass, fail. So that, right. that leaves it for the, the, the customer to make that determination, as Mike pointed out. Right. And, uh, but it still gives you the uncertainties and conditions of the yep. room and everything else that's accredited. So it is the same level, you know, the same quality as level one without the guard banding, without the additional math and the determination. So if I, before I turn over level three, John, I just want to say one quick thing about it. Um, for me, and I might have mentioned this earlier, and if I did, I apologize. But for me, if, if, if I did not require an accredited cal, but I would still choose a vendor that offers accredited cals. And the reason being is because all of the hard work and infrastructure that has to go in to creating that accredited cal, the quality system that has to be put in place, all that's still going to be used on your non-accredited calibration. We don't run two different systems here. We don't say, well, you need a non-accredited, it's a watered down lower level calibration. No, you're gonna get the same quality system. It's just not gonna have the compliance statement. It's not gonna have uncertainties. So the reason why I'm, I'm adamant about that is because your accreditation or, or the lab that is accredited has proven that they know and understand the quality system. They know and understand the document. So you're still going to get a piece of that with the non-accredited cal. You're going to get a higher level of calibration as far as accuracy and peace of mind that the, the body that's calibrating for you um, understands the highest level. Whereas if you need a non-accredited and you use somebody who's non-accredited, I mean, you're really at the mercy of whatever system they do or don't have. There's nobody there checking it. I mean, you can audit them, but most of these places won't even let you in the door. They'll send you a, a questionnaire. And, and again, like, a questionnaire is, is, is not great. So my, my recommendation is always use an accredited lab, even if you require non-accredited services. Having said that, John, if you wouldn't mind elaborating. No, that, 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 that's a really good point, Mike, because you've, you've actually, you've worked with a high quality and what you're doing is you're taking away to provide less, not quality, but less of the information, less of the, the, the calculations, less of the work to get to where it is. So it's really, it's higher level work in town as opposed to 
somebody that's used to working on the low level and then trying to reach up and get something high quality and high available, it, it doesn't work that way. It's easier, it's safer. So then we get to the uh, level three certificate. And this is, uh, this is there's plenty of need for this in the industry. R&D, you know, and we, as we know, I've been around for quite a while, the industry, when they have funding, it's not for calibration. It's not, has any, nothing to do with it. However, we have learned, they have learned over years, you can't reproduce something in the next level up, you can't transfer, you can't ramp up if you can't reproduce. So they kind of kind of learn over the years when they just couldn't be able to, weren't successful. They say, all right, we have to, have to do this. We have to budget it. So the budget is you get somebody to come in and calibrate it, okay? So the level three, you know, it's typical commercial calibration. You know, it is traceable, okay, through SI and this, absolutely. Using, using, John, using the same standards we would use for an accredited cal, same standards. Absolutely, yes. And it's not accredited, you know, it doesn't include the measurements. And, and to that point though, all the standards are accredited, calibrated with an accredited cal. So it's, it's the quality. That's right. That's right. So, mm -hmm. yep. You know? And, it, and it's, you know, and, and, and on a side, side note of that is that, you know, when you have a, an accredited lab, you've done, uh, and this goes, this applies to all accredited labs to, and to different levels, like anything else, though it's how serious you take it. Well, in order to get your certificate, your accreditation, not certification, your accreditation, you need to meet certain requirements. And these certain requirements for us, in one case where we added, it, it just give you a, a point, of uh, a reference, we added a little bit of pressure, uh, something different in humidity, mass, and a few other little small things. And the time and energy from our senior staff, senior metrologists, senior people within the laboratory, we put in just on the 6,000 hours within a four month period to be to get prep in anticipation of our certification. All right. right. That's a lot of hours and that's a lot of serious time and energy because what we want to be is ready because we do this prior to providing a calibration. It's not like the traditional 9001 certified. I say what I do, I do what I say, what have you. I have a standard, I could use it. I know what I'm doing. I put it in, I use it. You know, I don't have two of them. I don't have round robin. I don't have any of these things. So the idea is it's, 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 it's a process it's a procedure and it's a validated. And in our industry, we like validation only for the things we have to validate. And, the, and, and also to, to piggyback on John's point, um, the maintenance of, you know, maintaining your accreditation, the hours that goes into, um, you know, always we're constantly, you know, uncertainty budgets are not a static number. They're, they're organic. You know, when you look at them and you look at your charts month to month, whether it's a fixed point cell or an SPRT and the degradation, you know, you're, you're looking at all that and you want to quantify that and you want to make sure that the measurement uh, uncertainty itself is always being looked at. It's not a one and done number. So the amount of um, kind of quality and uh, high level metrology work that comes with the territory is continuous on a, on a year to year basis. So just to throw that out there as well. Um, and that is pretty much it for the presentation. I, I believe we might have a few questions. We have one more poll question, Mike, and then we do have some questions from the audience that I can throw out there. So let's Good. do a question first. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, just a question about the presentation itself and uh, if you get anything out of this and uh, our feedback you, you give us is very helpful. Good. Votes are still coming in, so we're going to give it a couple more seconds. <clears throat> okay. And here are the results. So 83% felt that, yes, it was helpful and an accreditation is needed. Uh, they do need accredited calibrations. 6%. Bill, they do not need an accredited calibration, and then 11% weren't sure. Okay. So I'm going to close it off, and um, Phil, if you want to draw the Q&A well, section. Um, let's start with uh, Andrew. 
is uh, what is the difference between traceable to XI and NIST traceable? Well, and John, you can chime in too, but the that's kind of what I alluded to earlier. You know, NIST traceable is a is a longer paragraph that um, has a, a longer definition, and it goes on to basically say that the piece of equipment that is calibrated and it's traceable to another piece of equipment or artifact and so on and so forth. The term NIST traceable is kind of, I guess, in the metrologist level, is possible because NIST is a, is a body or a government body or an institution. It's not an actual measurement. So you're traceable to a building. Um, so it gets confusing for people. Um, traceable to the SI is exactly what I mean in the pyramid. It's traceable to the back, right back to the international system of units or that artifact. So again, it's okay to use NIST traceable. Um, we, we prefer not to use it or, or to explain it uh, better as uh, traceable to the SI or something along those lines. Both correct, but, but yeah, the NIST traceable thing is kind of a, a funny inside joke because it's a little bit, but I hope that answers the question. Right, I always look at, at the traceable to the SI and it brings you right up to the top of that pyramid that we showed. Right, and the, and the and with the NIST, NIST is in parallel with the other organizations around the world and that, that MIs that are in um, by my lip, equivalent, but in some of them are because they all have specialties that they do, but they do a round robin, they hand carry, they go back and forth. So if we say it's this temperature in the United States and yes, it's traceable to a standard that might have been calibrated within NIST. NIST is still comparing throughout globally to make sure that they're within the uncertainties that's required that they gave us everything back and forth. So, good. Mm -hmm. good. Okay, Mike, we have a question from the audience. Um, should I require guard banding for all equipment or just the standards? I'm sorry, say that one again. Should I require guard banding for all equipment, just the standards? So, yeah, another good question. Um, based on the earlier presentation about process equipment or working standards, per personally, anything that is a standard is a, is a must because it's a higher level of calibration. Uh, it's easier to do deviations, especially for the end user if you have an excursion or, a, or, a, or an out of tolerance condition to be standard. It, it just holds a little bit more water because you're taking everything into the aspect of the measurement. Um, guard banding for lower level process level equipment, like we talked about, where an accredited cal might not necessarily be required. I would refer back to that that kind of um, slide that I talked about. I don't I don't think guard banding is required for everything. Definitely, I would use it for the same mentality that I outlined about accredited cals for primary standards and working standards, and then I would use your best judgment or consult someone like myself, your calibration provider, um, about do I need this level of cal? Do I need guard banding for these pieces of equipment? You know, it's very routine that John or I or Phil will, will show up at a customer site just to just to give them um, a peace of mind. They might not even use us as a as a cal house, but we carry a lot of experience and, and sometimes, you know, walking down their systems with them, we can help them kind of identify you know what you you might need or you might not and you know we, we, we try to help out as much as we can because ultimately we're problem solvers we're not we're not here just for metrology we're not here for business we are a company filled with problem solvers so the best way to look at it in the future is if you have a problem or you have a, a need for a solution i i would highly recommend you reach out to somebody at massey we could probably help you with that and you know i, I have can a have couple of questions <laughs> phil that just came in from the audience um, there's one that says we have our standards calibrated by ISO 17025 accredited suppliers. Who calibrates supplier master standards? That's a good question. So to give you an example, and again, I don't want to speak for the, those companies, but we have the ability to calibrate some of our own equipment. For instance, if you see in the, this picture for questions, that's one of our senior metrologists um, working with our fixed point cells. The fixed point cells themselves come uh, get quantified at NIST. Uh, the SPRTs uh, we calibrate. So the, the traceability goes back to NIST for the actual fixed point cell themselves. So some of the things that these cal houses can do themselves, um, they can they can test or or quantify some of these primary standards or um, internally. If not, they must use somebody or something that 
can offer um, basically a good ratio, a good a good number of what their best capabilities versus what you're after. So like behind me in the mass lab, our weights go directly to NIST. There's there's really not, there's nobody other than an NMI to John's point, whether it's NRC or, or NIST, our weights, we, we hand drive to Gatesburg, Maryland, because they're, in our mind, our uncertainties are so low that the only ones that can quantify them and keep our uncertainty ratios where we're happy with them is, is NIST. So it's, it's worth a conversation to your Cal provider, um, to the person who um, inquired or asked that question. Um, have a just general conversation. You know, if you walk me through your standards, what's the highest level of piece of equipment that you can use, that you can quantify, and what do you have that leaves the building, and what does that look like? Where does that go? These are some of the great audit questions that we get, and you know, and then we have this dialogue and this discussion. And of course, with our quality system, we have it all documented. That's important too. So. I would say that it's okay to calibrate your own stuff to a degree, but again, if, if you didn't document it, it didn't happen. If you document it right, then the proofs and the measurement. So, just some of the ideas of kind of where your head should be when you're thinking about, you know, how is your Cal provider quantifying its standards? It, it, hopefully, that helps answer the question. Mike, I have another one that's maybe you already covered with that last question, but I'll read it anyway um, from the audience. What is your opinion on? companies who offer ISO 17025 compliant calibration certificates. Yeah, you, like everybody who knows me that's in this webinar and people I work with, they, they know that I'm a straight shooter. Um, the word compliant to me is, is doing the company a disservice because if, if, I, if that was me and someone said I'm 17025 compliant, that, it, that almost indicates that I found potentially some gray area and I found a way to wiggle around it. You know, Weasel words. So, so I'm not. I'm not saying they're wrong. Please don't take that that way. They they might be wonderful. Um, actually, I'm trying to make sure we don't say it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, you know, you you want to just these are the things that you need to kind of just put like a little feather in your cap. And when you have your or you have your questions, these are the exact good questions that you should be asking. Like, why did you choose the word compliant? Like, why not? Um, you know, like fully the gap to or something along those lines or a full gap analysis um, why is the word compliant that, that that to me jumps off the jumps off the screen so to answer it to circle back yes it's probably okay but it's probably worth the conversation right yes in regard to uh, uh, uh who, who's got okay so if somebody says they're compliant too we've seen this from the beginning of time when we were uh, uh, nine, seven, uh, 9001 and we wanted 17 or 25 it was a lot of work trying to identify who, what audit, what company that we should be working with, the, the assessors to be able to figure it out. And then we, we were sending our standards out. And we, and we, you know, when you were ignorant, you see something that says 17025 compliant. And you say, well, what's the difference? When you right. get into the mud and you understand those 6,000 hours that we put in for that additional, uh, uh, additional um, scope, you know, that didn't come from a statement that said compliant. The round robins, the whole deep dive from a third party coming in, you know, it would cost you $25,000 for, for the accrediting body to come in, spend days and days around crawling through all different components of that, the anticipation before that. How do you be compliant? You know, I mean, do you just simply check it off and it's compliant, you know? So that puts the onus on the customer who wants this done, says, well, it's compliant. I have to deep dive, I have to go in there, and you've got to be an SME to go through what each of the different discipline that you, your 9001 certified company says they do it, you've got to go deep and follow through and check with that. Is it really what you want to do? I, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's a tough one. Yeah. yeah. Good question, very good question. Yeah. Okay, we have, we have time for one more question, everybody, and this is from Jack. Um, he's asking why there are so many FA results for labs developing tests for detection of the virus. So, I'm sorry, say the beginning part of them. Uh, why are there so many FA results for labs developing tests? I, I, I assume for the virus, the COVID-19 virus, and working on that. Oh, false, I, I'm assuming you're false saying. False yeah, I'm sorry. Why are there so many false accept results? 
Well, well so, okay. So this is outside of the purview, obviously. I'm not a scientist. I'm <laughs> analytically in a lab. But what I can say is statistics and the way that math is applied, and I know a lot of you in the audience are very familiar with all the forms of it, um, is, is basically statistics are how you present the data. And when you, when you get something to market, I don't believe that everything is had been fully fleshed out. For instance, if if you have a device in metrology and you want it to make a measurement, and you might not realize that there's some devices in our age that we put in our thunder chambers at a minimum, best case scenario, is six weeks. But if the world it doesn't have six weeks to wait, they're going to find a way to try to shorten that cycle and then run some risk. There it is again. They're going to run some risk that they're going to get it wrong because the lion's share is gonna be right. I know that sounds crude, but that's the way I take that. So if I can give you 100% acceptance or true value over six weeks, but I only have three weeks, well, guess what? Something somewhere is gonna to have to be cut knowing that it's gonna introduce some level of doubt. But if I have a 70% success rate, that's at least 70% of the people that I can tell you do, in fact, or you don't, in fact, have it instead of waiting for the tweets and it spreads too far. So they won't come out and say it, but sometimes they mitigate, they, or they pick what they want to mitigate on the false accept just to say that we need to get something out there, even though we know it's not perfect. Is that, I, I know it's not necessarily in line with metrology, but I hope that kind of makes sense the way I explained it. Yeah, Mike, that makes sense. And you know, and, and to, to elaborate on that, it comes down to timing and price. Okay, like you said, something that could take a lot longer. You can go through multiple methods to verify, you know, and, and you come down and say, I got three verifications of the same sample that says it's false. I got three samples I've done together, or multiple that says it's positive. That's good. but you're taking one sample, you've reduced it down to as fast as possible. And your cost because you know everybody can't afford to have a scientific project or piece that's going to cost you know three thousand dollars to determine whether you have it or you don't have it it boils down everybody wants it for a two dollar dollar three fifty you know and then what's the ratio is it 50 50 well i'll do it again you know, the pregnancy test is back in the 70s you know 50 50 yep. try it again try it again try this manufacturer try that manufacturer you know in about three or four months you know which one was right it's, a, it's an excellent question, actually. I know it's a little bit on the outer edge of, of where we're, what we're talking about, but it really it's a really brilliant question if you think about it as far as accept, false accept or, or risk or risk-based approach or any of those. It's exactly what John said, and it's, it's a fantastic question, actually. Really, I, 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 didn't, I wasn't prepared for it, so I hope I answered it correctly, but in my mind, I'm, I'm a straight shooter, and in my head, that's what formulated, so I apologize if it's not what, what, uh, what you were asking. If, if I could, and if I could add just one comment is uh, best practices. What this is all about, how we try to tell us about to is, you know, which, which each, whatever is necessary for the particular task is what you want to do. And best practices, we're in a calibration lab, a metrology lab that's accredited, certified, what have you, you know, what the requirements are. But the best practices, you know, which is what we've implemented, we've embraced, we, you know, we, we done a lot with you, know, you also use that you disseminate to our customers and our clients and our you know and our co-partners and what you're doing is you're trying to raise the excellence you're trying to bring up the uh, center of excellence you're trying to make it better for those components that need to be our industry there's a there's very little room for compromise you know every our industry is involved in medicines that are making sick people better you know and we say well it's close enough Maybe there's a different industry that's close enough, but in this industry, for the certain application, you need to be so. Yeah, really good, really good questions. I would, to be honest yeah. with you, I wish we could chat even longer, but I mean, unfortunately, we have other things to do. So I think we are at the end of our time for this. I want to thank everybody for attending. Um, I hope you found it helpful. I know I enjoyed it. So. Um, and like I said, I'm going to reiterate it one last time before people jump off. Uh, please feel free to reach out. Uh, if you have a general question, um, not to get into the detail, but you know, I myself have over 20 plus years working directly for a big pharmaceutical company. I understand GMP. Uh, Phil as well. Uh, John, obviously, I mean, if I gave you John's credentials, uh, you literally would fall asleep. Um, so 
if you have questions, feel free to ask whether it's metrology related or not. We, we really are here to help people solve problems. Yeah. And I will say this one thing, yeah. Mike and his metrologist here, he always says this and it's true. They're about the science of metrology, you know, Service. measurement. They're, they're not about the business side. That's where I come in and John comes in. So we, we have Mike and his, his group of uh, metrologists, they worry about the science and we just hope our customers can appreciate that. And, and not to give away anything else on top of that, to prove the point, Phil is not part of my organization. So there is no conflict of interest. So I don't have to worry about the sales side. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Thank everyone. You, um, you should be receiving a uh, recording of this webinar within the next 24 to 48 hours. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to the metrology team. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe.